Michael. All right, I gotta, um, I gotta confess something to you today. Uh, I have never really enjoyed writing New Year's sermons. All right, as a preacher, I just feel kind of boxed in because you all come to church on the first Sunday of the year expecting a sermon on New Year's resolutions, and I personally don't do New Year's resolutions, right? Mainly because I know I don't stick with New Year's resolutions, right? Setting a New Year's resolution is just setting myself up for disappointment in two weeks when I break my New Year's resolution. Notice I said two weeks because that's as far as I'm getting. I just, I know it. You know, I know me. That's all I've got. And so I don't want to set that kind of pressure on myself. And so I don't do New Year's resolutions. I do New Year's suggestions or New Year's Maybe, maybe not, right? This way, if, or more likely when, I, don't, I fail, I don't feel like a complete failure. So in 2022, I may or may not get back into decent shape. You'll know how well I'm doing in about two weeks. The point is, I'm not going to preach on New Year's resolutions today. Not really. If you want to make a New Year's resolution, then good for you. Get after it. And in two weeks, we can all laugh together about how silly we were to think we could actually do it. I'm kidding, right? All right. If you set a New Year's resolution, I hope you do stick with it. Unless it's not healthy or it's a sin, then I hope you fail spectacularly. Um, but if you're going to set one, set one and go after it. But this is not a New Year's resolution <coughs> sermon. This is a New Year's attitude adjustment sermon. Look, if you want to lose weight this year, that's great. I hope you do it. If you want to stop doing that thing you know you shouldn't be doing, I hope you do it. That's great. If you want to start giving more, great, do it. But what I want to talk about today is more important than all of that. In fact, what I want to talk about uh, will help us achieve those goals and help make 2022 the best year yet. I want to talk about a life of praise, a life of of worship, a life focused on the worship of Jesus Christ, right? You wake up praising Jesus. You, you praise Jesus while you brush your teeth. You praise Jesus while you drive to work. You praise Jesus while you work. You praise Jesus while you clean the bathroom. You praise Jesus while you cook. You praise Jesus when you get bad news. You praise Jesus when the relationship ends. No matter what happens in your life, you praise Jesus. Not praising Jesus for whatever happens, but praising Jesus regardless of what happens. Regardless of what happens in 2022, we will praise Jesus. I'm talking about a life of praise. And he's worthy of our praise. Amen, church? Amen. He is worthy of our praise. And so I want to read a short psalm this morning, Psalm 100. This psalm is the secret to unlocking your best year. This is it. If you will build your 2022 on Psalm 100, then you're going to you're going to love the person you become. Right? Your spouse is going to love the person that you become. Your your kids are going to love who you will become. Your parents will love who you become. This is it. This is the verse for our 2022. This is the verse for the gathering church in 20 22. So look at it with me. Get your Bible, open your phone. I want you to highlight it. I want you to bookmark it, whatever you want to do, but I need you to do it. And if you aren't bringing your Bible to church, you need to start bringing your Bible to church. If you've not downloaded the Bible app on your brand new phone, you need to download the Bible app because I want each of you going to this passage right now because you need to learn how to find things in your Bible. Don't just read it off the screen. This is about your faith. You need to know how to find things. So it's Psalm 100. If you don't know where that is, you have a physical Bible, open up your Bible to the middle, and you're most likely going to be in Psalms. Psalm 100. Look at it with me. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is 
good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to, uh, to, continues to each generation. I want to walk us through today those five verses. So I want to start with verses 1 and 2. Leave your Bibles open. Leave your phone open. Now, I don't know what Bible translation you use, but I typically preach from the New Living Translation. That's typically what's up on the screen. And so Zoe's got it up there right now. Once you look at the screen, what's that first word? Shout. What's that first word? Shout. There you go. It makes no sense to just say shout. It's shout. So someone say Shout. No, someone say shout. shout. There you go. See, verse 1 and 2 say shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. See, where did we get this idea that we have to be quiet in church? As soon as some folks start worshiping Jesus by making a little noise, everyone starts to get a little uncomfortable. But hear me, church, the Bible that the quiet people are reading is the same Bible that the noisemakers are reading. And verse 1 says, shout with joy to the Lord all, someone say all, all, all the earth. Now some translations say shout triumphantly to the Lord. The message paraphrase says, on your feet now, applaud God. See, the point is clear. Make some noise for the Lord. Psalm 98 4 says the same thing. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. See, what the psalmist is referring to is this idea of a trumpet blast, right? The blast of a trumpet that a loyal subject would give when the king comes around. Now, in modern vernacular, it's like yelling, uh, trying to get your favorite celebrity's attention, right? I was, I was uh, recently watching the new documentary on Disney Plus about the Beatles. Uh, it's really long, but if you love the Beatles, I highly recommend it. And it's, it's footage taken from the recording of what would eventually turn out to be the Let It Be album. If you don't know who I'm talking about, then get out. I'm kidding. Uh, I'll talk to you later. But the beginning... The very beginning of the documentary, they, they quickly give the viewer this recap of the Beatles' rise to fame. They show all the famous footage, right, of the teenage girls losing their minds when they would see John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Most of you have seen this footage, right? The girls would go crazy. They would be crying and grabbing their faces, you know, all for the Fab Four, right? Now, some of you did that for the Backstreet Boys or, or uh, New Kids on the Block, if you're a little older, or, or Justin Bieber, if you're a little younger. But when those girls saw the Beatles... Something would just take over their bodies, right? They were uncontrollable and a bit annoying, but uncontrollable. They could not hold back, right? They wanted the Beatles to see them. They wanted the Beatles to hear them. They wanted the Beatles to know that they were there. They couldn't help but shout. And yet we have been taught when we walk into a church, we better be the quiet little church mouse. Now, I'm not talking about being noisy for the sake of being noisy. I'm not talking about being a distraction or causing a scene to draw attention to yourself. I'm talking about not being afraid to make a joyful noise to the Lord. I remember in my first church, I made some folks a bit uncomfortable. It was a small church about an, about an hour north of here, and they had a tradition of having a children's moment during the service. Some of you have experienced this in a church. At some point, it's that time in the service when the kids are invited to come down and, and the pastor or someone on staff shares with them a short Bible lesson. And, and as the pastor of this church, it was my job to do it. And so one day, I, one Sunday, I showed up with pots and pans and large spoons. And when the kids came down for children's time, I talked to them about this idea of making a joyful noise. I told them that when we are worshiping Jesus, it's okay to make some noise. To get excited and to let that excitement uh, lead us to making noise. And then I pulled out the box of pots and pans. And I told the kids that today we're going to make a joyful noise. And I saw the eyes of some of the adults in the room get as big as those pots and pans, right? Then I handed out the new instruments. And then I led the children on a parade around the sanctuary, banging those pots and pans. We made a joyful noise. I'm pretty sure not everyone loved it, but too bad, right? See, Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins 
and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' words, become like little children, it means a lot of different things. But one of the things I think Jesus was talking about is about how excitable kids are. Right? Some of you uh, discovered that on Christmas morning or saw that on Christmas morning, right? You give a kid exactly what he wants, and he's running all over the house screaming about it. But kids also get excited right, when you come home from a long day at work. Also dogs, but kids too do that as well, right? Just the other day, I, I ran to Publix, and I was gone for maybe 20 minutes. And when I walked through the door, Ziana, our four-year-old, she shouted, Daddy! And she ran and gave me a hug. Church, why are we so quiet in church? You see, here's the thing. Our daddy is here. Our Savior is here. The Messiah is here. The Holy Spirit is here. Why are we quiet? We are called to make a joyful noise for the King is here. Someone say amen. 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 I want you to understand another aspect of this whole shout with joy to the Lord. It's also a shout of triumph or a battle cry. See, shouting with joy to the Lord is how we enter the battle of life. And you probably know this. Every day is a battle. Some of you know that better than others. Some days the battle just seems too big. Some days the battle seems too hard. And if that's the case, then shout with joy to the Lord. That's how you enter the battle, by shouting with joy to the Lord, the one who has already won the battle. And so wake up shouting because the Lord is with you. He is with you. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So shout for joy all the earth. Now notice what verse 2 says. Come before him singing with joy. I don't know what's more difficult, getting people to shout in church or getting people to sing in church. Now, you would think it would be more difficult to get them to shout, but I, I don't know if that's true. I have known a lot of people who simply refuse to sing in church, and nothing that I could do was ever going to change that. They just were not going to sing. And, and I get it in a sense, right? It requires this, this vulnerability. Especially when you know for a fact that you cannot carry a tune. Maybe you have sung somewhere before and everybody stopped what they were doing. They just stared at you, but not in a good way. Right? I get it. But I also know that you're belting Taylor Swift when you're alone in your car. You know you are. So hear me. The psalmist is very clear. Come before him singing with joy. Church, we are called to sing. It doesn't say come before him singing with joy if you have a good voice. It just says sing with joy. I got a great education in this growing up. My mamma bear, my mom's mom, she couldn't find the right notes with a map and a flashlight. <laughs> she couldn't sing, like, at all. But my mamma bear, she did not care. When it came time to sing, she was going to sing, and not quietly, right? And as a child, I wanted to crawl under my seat so people knew, didn't know I was with her, right? I mean, she could not sing, y'all, but she sang, and she sang loud. And as a kid, I didn't get it. I'm thinking, Mamaw, you can't sing. Close your mouth. Why would anyone who couldn't sing choose to sing in public? But as I got older, I began to understand what she was doing. She was singing to her Savior because he was her audience. She had an audience of one. Now, while her single, uh, singing was a great model for me, it wasn't the number one, number one reason she sang out. She sang out because her Lord was worthy of her song. Hear me, church. She sang out because her Lord was worthy of her song. One preacher put it this way. Music is the form through which we often express our gladness, our joy, and our praise. Now hear this part. Our songs are not to create our gladness, but to express it. Through our singing, we approach God. It is a fit anticipation for heaven. 
Now, I know some of you are new to the Bible, so I want you to know the book of Psalms is really just a collection of 150 songs. Songs and singing have always been an essential part between humans and God. I don't care if the music is played on a piano or an electric guitar. If it's being sung to the Lord, it's good enough for me. Hear me. The style is not important. Hear that. I hear people arguing about traditional or modern worship. Right? Which one is better? Which one is right? Hear me. Style does not matter. It is substance. True worship is the expression of our individual worshiping lives. Our worship on Sunday morning is so closely tied to our worship Monday through Saturday. I want you to understand this. This life of praise I was talking about has an incredible impact on our corporate worship on Sunday morning. When we live lives of praise, lives of worship, then when we all gather together on Sunday and worship together, heaven and earth are going to move. People are going to walk in here who have never experienced the Lord, and they're going to be engulfed in his love. The Holy Spirit will move in ways you have never seen. That's when we will see chains fall off. That's when we'll see people healed. healed. And so church, sing, shout, Make a joyful noise. And then verse 3. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. See, our praise is not for us. Our praise, our worship is for Jesus. It's all for Him or it's hollow. Hear that. It's all for Him or or it's hollow. It's all for him, or it's missing its core, and therefore it is a waste of your time and his. True worship is born out of acknowledging that the Lord is God. True worship is born out of knowing and proclaiming that he is Lord. True worship is born out of knowing who he is and who he says you are. It's like when Ziana met me at the door when I came home from public. She, said, she yelled, Daddy! See, she knew who I was and who I was to her. I'm her daddy, and she is my child. And when she, when she yelled, Daddy, a huge smile formed on my face. That's what God feels like when we acknowledge him in worship. One preacher said, acknowledging God is the intellectual side of our worship protocol. Mentally, we acknowledge the God of the universe. Our worship is to have a firm foundation based on the creator of God. This is the precursor to praise. When we know him, we truly worship. When we know him, we truly praise. When, when you know Jesus, when you know what he's done in your life, it compels you to praise, to worship. It excites you. When we, when we come in here, one of the first things we do almost every Sunday is we acknowledge that God is good. We don't do this just for, for no reason. It is to focus our attention on who he is. And when we know who he is, we know he is worthy of our praise and our worship. So church, do you know him? And if you do, you know he's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of everything you've got. So as verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Now up to this point, we, we've been using the words praise and worship. And often we use those words interchangeably. But in reality, they mean different things. See, in, the, in its truest sense, praise is not worship. Praise sets the stage for worship. Praise anticipates what is to come. And what is to come, what is created through our praise, is an audience with the king. An audience with God. Do you see that? The psalmist says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. See, praise is the key. Praise gets us in the door. Praise gets us into his presence. In his book, Worship 365, David Edwards writes, when we praise God, we are, bring, uh, we are ringing the doorbell, making our presence known, letting him know that we have come to see him. 
When he hears our praise, he gets up to open the door and invites us to come in. When we go inside, we move from praise to worship. In other words, praise is the vehicle into God's presence, and worship is what we do once we get into God's presence. David wrote of God in Psalm 23, 3, but you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. That means praise creates the atmosphere for an audience with the king. We come before God with thanksgiving and praise on our lips and our hearts. And then verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and His faithfulness continues to each generation. Church, this is why we praise Him. This is why we worship Him. Because the Lord is good. Good. Do you know that today? I know life is hard. I know life can knock the breath out of you. But the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is faithful 100% of the time. He can't not be faithful. He keeps his word. God's love will never fail. His love has gone before you. His love is surrounding you. His love is going uh, uh, uh the love is going to go anywhere you go. No one is outside of his love. There is nothing you can do to lose his love. His grace is abundant and sufficient. There is nothing he can't get you through. There is nothing that he can't forgive. There is nowhere you can run that he cannot find you. He is the overcomer. He is the conqueror of all that could conquer us. He is our life. He is our hope. He is our defender. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. He is good and he is so glad you are here. Amen. Hear me. He is glad you are here. While we delight in his presence, he delights in ours. Oh, he's glad you're here. And he's worthy of your praise. But not just today. He's worthy of our praise and our worship when we leave here. As I said, he's worthy of our praise and worship when we go back to work. He's worthy of our praise and worship when we go back to school. He's worthy of our praise and worship when we do the dishes. He's worthy of our praise as you clean the toilet. He's worthy of our praise and our worship no matter what happens in 2022. See, I truly believe if the gathering church is a church full of people who live lives of praise and worship, then heaven and earth are going to move here in East Cobb, 2022 will be the year an untold number of people in East Cobb will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because we, the gathering church, chose to live lives of praise and worship. Is this who we will be in 2022? Is this who we will be in 2022? If you want to call it a resolution, go right ahead. Whatever you want to call it. Will you be a person of praise and worship because he is worthy? Church, Jesus is born, Jesus is alive, and Jesus is going to come again. So let us praise and worship the king. Is that what you want in 2022? Yes. Well, good. Because we start right now. We're going to praise Jesus. We're going to enter his courts with praise. And we're going to delight in him as he delights in us. So I'm going to pray and Michael's going to come back up and we're going to sing a little bit more. Now you don't have any excuses. You've heard the sermon. Now I'm listening. Hear me. This is, it's not about lifting your hand in worship. You don't have to do that. It's about understanding that he is your audience. I'm not your audience. The person next to you is not your audience. Who cares if they think you can't sing? I, I mean that. Who cares? Who cares? Your voice singing praises to your Lord is the most beautiful sound to our Savior's ears. So worship him. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. We're going to pray. And then we're going to worship.
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are worthy of praise. You are holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. You are worthy of our praise. Even when life seems chaotic and out of control, you are still on the throne, therefore you are worthy of our praise. Even when we rebuke you and say, Lord, I don't want anything to do with you because I'm, I'm so angry, you continue to love us and therefore you are worthy of our praise. Even when we have wandered so far away from you and spent our money on things that, that would embarrass our moms, you still love us. And so therefore you're worthy of our praise. When we decide to come home, you get off your front porch and you run to us. Therefore, you're worthy of our praise. Even when we have messed up our lives and messed up our marriages, you're still in control. You're still the God who can redeem, the God who can restore. You're still the God who can forgive. You're still a God who pours out love and grace and hope and joy. You are still God, and you are still worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, let the gathering church be known as the shouting church. Not because we want attention on ourselves, but we want people to know this church loves Jesus. And this, this church wants to, to, to enter his courts with our praises so that we can sit in the throne of God and worship him. We don't want to just do church. But we want an audience with the king. And so today we shout with praise. We proclaim that you are worthy everything we've got. So Lord, right now as we worship you, take away our embarrassment, take away our pride, and I pray that we can just sing out. If your Holy Spirit moves and we just feel like shouting an amen or shouting a hallelujah or just shouting, we wouldn't hold back because this is a church that embraces that, encourages that, won't laugh at that. We just want people to worship you. We want people to praise you. Let us be free in our praise. Let us be free in our praise. Sure. For this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.